Hey Metal VC, this is Spencer, um, Surface Noise Vinyl, back with uh, a new video. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, today I wanted to do a response video to uh, Killing for Company, which is Kalen's channel. Um, I thought he brought up an excellent topic, and uh, I've got a few things I'd like to add to it. So, uh, his topic was, can metalheads be audiophiles? And my short answer is, yeah, why the hell not? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but it's obviously not that simple. Um, I think being accepted as a metalhead audiophile is a whole other thing. So, um, I also, uh, today I watched, um, Simon Explosive Action's, uh, response video to this topic as well, and I thought that was interesting because we had a couple of, uh, uh, he had a couple of, of opinions that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, the main one being uh, that he considered himself to not be an audiophile, um, even though he does care about how his music sounds, how his metal sounds, how his raw, dirty death metal sounds, um, but he didn't, didn't consider himself to actually be an audiophile. I feel differently in the fact that I 100% consider myself an audiophile because I, even though I don't have a ton of money, um, I've definitely been chasing a better sound you know my whole adult life I'm 43 now so I've been doing this for at least 20 years um, so yeah um, fuck it I'm gonna call myself an audiophile <laughs> and uh, I don't care if those guys that think metal sucks and isn't real music uh, don't consider me one I do so and I have friends that are audiophiles um, and I have friends that aren't and I'm sure most of the audiophiles aren't into metal some of them are um, you know, not as big as me probably, but, uh, yeah, whatever. It's, it's just a label, and if you want to label yourself that, then you can do that. Um, so just a little background about how I got into all this, um, and I do have notes here. I apologize, but I won't remember all my points if I don't. Um, so, yeah, my love of music definitely started when I was... A little little kid as early as I can remember like some of my earliest memories were um, listening to my dad's hi-fi system um, stuff like let it bleed by the Rolling Stones and dire straits um, uh, brothers in arms and just countless countless hour uh, hours yeah countless hours and just countless uh, albums as well he had a big uh, record collection it still does um, and that definitely inspired and fueled my lifelong passion for music and then when I was old enough I started playing uh, uh, I first started playing uh, piano took some piano lessons absolutely hated it uh, switched over to trombone in school played that for like six years all throughout junior high and high school um, and then at some point uh, in late junior high, I started playing the drums, which I still play to today. Um, so and then my dad um, was, uh, you know, responsible for getting me into collecting uh, equipment, and uh, you know, starting to realize that equipment makes a difference in how things sound. Um, he, you know, gave me my first set of speakers that he made himself that I still have, um, and uh, you know, gave me amps and and kind of explained to me how how uh, how stereos work. Um, so so you know, fast forward thirty years, and my passion is if not, it's still there. It's probably even stronger than it than it was. Um, you know, I have a little bit more money to throw at my stereo system, and, you know, obviously I buy uh, CDs, tapes, vinyl, and I will show some of this eventually. Maybe not in this all this video, but I will. I am going to show my room and, and a lot of my stuff at some point. Uh, I will show my stereo in this video at the end, so stay tuned for that. Um, so, as I said, I definitely consider myself an audiophile because... I'm always listening to my main system with a critical ear. I'm always tweaking it, trying to make it a little bit better. Um, and that's not always about throwing more money at it. I mean, yeah, I've done that. 
Um, you know, I'm sure I've thrown a few grand at it over many years, not all at once, but, you know, I tweak it here and there, you know, work on my turntable one year, work on an amp. Uh, this year was all about amps, so I'll get into that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm definitely not an electronics wizard. I couldn't take an amp apart and put it back together and have it work. No way. Um, I'd say I only have a basic knowledge of how stereos work. T to me, it's not about how it works. It's just that it does work and how it sounds, how it sounds to me, and if it sounds good to my ears. That's what's important to me. Um, I definitely love a warm, vintage sound. Um, all of my equipment, except for my turntable, is vintage. Um, and vintage can be anything over 25 years, so I think my CD player is considered vintage. I'm not sure the exact date. I think it's probably early 2000s, but... Um, so, yeah, I just think that from older equipment, uh, you do get kind of that warmer, more vintage. And like with vinyl, you know, you get that sound that... Um, and even CD players, I think. Um, less so with CD players, because digital is less forgiving, as we all know, but... Um, yeah, there's just a sound that you don't get with modern gear. And and to be honest, I can't afford modern gear. So I'm always scrounging on, you know, Facebook groups or uh, Canadians' equivalent of Craigslist, which would be um, Kijiji. Um, are, they're great places to, uh, to find used gear. And another one is uh, a local uh, audiophile group uh, in my hometown that is also great for, for finding used gear. So... I definitely check that out and a lot of the guys on there are definitely not metal heads I mean you know they might be into like Metallica and Megadeth you know the big four of thrash and stuff like that but they're definitely not you know excited for the new Celtic Frost box set or the new Dark Throne album or something right so yeah I guess why am I an audiophile if I don't in fit in um, I think I, I probably already said this but because I care about how my music sounds I take pride in my music collection and in my stereo equipment, um, and it's been a lifetime, lifelong passion, as I said. Uh, it just it fills me with happiness, and I think it's pretty hard to put a price tag on that. So if I have to pay, you know, a few more bucks to get that experience, to know that, you know, it sounds um, really good and as good as I am able to make it sound, I guess, then, uh, yeah, I'm all for that. Um, but you know the music always comes first not the equipment um you know i'm not one of those guys that's always seeking out the best of everything because frankly i just can't afford it um you know i don't make a ton of money i've got two kids and a wife she works too but um you know she's not gonna pay for my uh, my obsession that's for sure um so yeah i think a lot of audiophiles do tend to lose sight of the music i think they uh they do focus on the equipment more, and uh, yeah, I don't think that's all that healthy. So anyway, now I'm going to pause here and do a little quick setup switch, and we'll look at the system. And if you're wondering what's playing in the background, oh, just stopped. Evoken Acromores. It's on profound lore. Uh, amazing Death Doom. Highly, highly recommend these guys. This is awesome stuff okay so here's my main setup um, the big black box on the bottom is a Hafler power amp it's an American company it's a 115 watt per channel solid-state stereo power amplifier and uh, let me tell you this thing is a beast um, the light actually dims when the power is switched on but uh, it's more than just a lot of power. Um, even at low volume, I find this amp really sounds great. And then on top of it uh, is my latest addition. It's the Hafler DH100 Stereo Preamp. Um, it's pretty simple, bare bones. There's not a whole lot to it. Um, it's just a great little preamp and um, paired with the power amp, uh, it sounds amazing. Um, so you can see starting from the left it's treble, well first is the power button on with a little um, red LED, then it's treble, bass and your balance, and then you've got four inputs, 
at a tape, auxiliary, a tuner, and phono, and then there's the volume knob. Um, so this amp does have a built-in um, phono preamp, uh, which would be the phono input. Um, but if you want to plug in uh, a separate phono preamp, which is the smaller black box on the top with a blue button, blue light, I mean, that is a music hall, uh, a music hall phono preamp. And um, I do have the record player hooked up to that right now, uh, even though I don't necessarily need it because it does have the built-in stereo preamp um, in, in the uh, Heffler preamp there. Uh, Sorry, it does have the phono preamp built into the, the Heffler, but um, I think the the uh, the music hall that phono preamp just gives it a little extra boost and makes it sound maybe slightly better. But I'm just experimenting with that, um, so don't hold me to it. Um, so. Yeah, these two amps were just, they were made to work together. They complement each other perfectly. Um, and they add an amazing clarity and depth to my doom, <laughs> doomiest records. Um, the new Skepticism album, for instance, uh, sounds amazing. I was listening to it last night and it just it blew me away. Uh, so both of these amps were uh, manufactured between 1984 and 1990. So definitely vintage, um, and uh, and also a ton of bass. Although the bass, a uh, huge increase in bass, I've noticed. It might actually be the speakers now that I've got you know a proper amount of power going into the speakers, because the speakers draw a bit of power too. But I'll get to those in a second. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about my turntable. So here's my turntable. Uh, as you can see, I've. Uh, put a, a whole bunch of cool stickers on it um, when I bought this turntable it was new but um, it had been used once and then returned to the store um, and they actually scratched up the the uh, dust cover a little bit so I decided well why don't I just put stickers on it and it looks cooler that way anyway so uh, so the turntable is a Rega RP3 manual belt drive with an Ortofon red cartridge um, so uh, yeah, it's it's manual. So I'll explain a little bit about that. And this is where I have a bone to pick with Simon because he said, "Don't ever buy a manual turntable. They're terrible." Um, and it's like going back in time. And yeah, I mean, you're kind of right. But let me point out that I've had this turntable for ten years plus, and the only thing I've had to do to it is. Uh, you know, switch the, the cartridge, which you have to do every thousand hours, every year and a half, two years, whatever. You've, you've got to switch the cartridge, especially if you listen to a lot like I do. So, other than that, I haven't had to place the belt yet. I haven't had to, after the initial setup even, I mean, it may now, it could probably use a new setup because, yeah, it's been, like I said, years, um, you know, almost 10 years, I think. Um, but, and I will show you how to switch speeds on it. It, it it'll do 33 and a half and 45, the, the two main ones, and and it's really not that difficult. It takes seconds to do. Um, you know, he's talking about cleaning your record and your stylus every time, which is a good thing to do. He's right, um, but also you can very easily just uh, change the speed by moving the the uh, the belt. Um, <coughs> And also, I should mention, you can get uh, speed boxes, they're called, which will connect to the turntable, and with pre a press of a button, you can easily switch um, the speeds and not have to actually move the, the belt. So, in order to do that, let's open this up. So, like I said, I because I've had this turntable for a while, I'm not sure exactly what they retail for now. Um, but I think when I bought it, it was around 800 to 1,000 bucks. Um, can't remember the exact price. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're looking for you know a, a middle to slightly higher level uh, turntable. You really can't go wrong with Rega, and and also Project. I've had a Project table before this, um, 
that one was just a little bit you know dinkier um not not quite as solidly built as this one this one has you know a really strong uh platter or sorry it has a really strong base um it does have some rubber feet and then you can see uh just down there that is actually an old cutting board that i have uh repurposed um just helps with um vibration and stuff you know i can i can come down here and and dance while listening to music if i want and it's it's not going to skip so um so this is a lovely uh, sepultura uh, felt mat here sepultura felt mat that i get um okay and there is the uh glass pl uh, platter uh so it's a nice big solid piece of glass so you just lift that off and then you can see right here is the uh the rubber belt and right now it's on 45 and if I want to play 33 I just switch it up to 33 that's it I mean it couldn't be any simpler really so and as I said there's like virtually no maintenance to do this thing like I said it probably could use uh, a setup again um, but I mean with a table like this it doesn't even have anti-skate you don't need it because it doesn't, it just doesn't need it. <laughs> um, so turn it on there. And uh, like I said, in 10 years, it's been perfect 33 and a half, perfect 45 every single time. So yeah, I highly recommend these tables. Um, they are totally worth it in my opinion. So. And if you didn't know, uh, Rega is uh, an English company. So, moving down to the CD player. Now, I actually have a couple of CD players, um, but the main one I use, this fender is in the top right corner there. <laughs> yeah, so I actually have a couple of CD players, but the main one I use is the Sony. Um, it's a five disc CD changer um, and let's see if I can read the model number it is a CDP this is a Sony five disc CD exchange system compact disc player CDP CE245 is the model um, yeah it's just a great cha uh, sounding um, five disc changer that I actually got at a local um, thrift shop for 15 bucks and it was still in the original box. Um, yeah, the only thing that was missing was the remote control, but that's not a deal breaker. You don't really need the remote. Um, it's fine. So what else do I have? Um, below that is uh, an equalizer that, um, an ex coworker gave me. Um, I've never even hooked it up. I think it works, but once again, you don't really need an equalizer. I know Simon mentioned that too. Um, it's just not really a thing that's needed, in my opinion. Especially not for metal, maybe for more nuanced music. Um, and then here in the left, um, at the bottom, is uh, a Sony VCR. Um, and above that is my Tascam 130 uh, cassette deck. Um, yeah, this is an amazing sounding cassette player. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. It's, uh, it's just a great little cassette player. Um, sounds amazing and uh, I'd recommend it if uh, you're in the market for a cassette deck. Last but not least, uh, this is my uh, Energy Pro 22 loudspeakers. Um, and uh, a little bit about them. They were produced in the mid 80s, the early 90s. They're a two way, two driver loudspeaker system. Uh, frequency response is 28 hertz to 45 kilohertz and uh, it's recommended that the amplifier have between 2 and 200 watts. Mine are around 115 watts, so 
fits in quite nicely. Um, I was really lucky to find an immaculate pair of these speakers. Um, I traded in a couple of old amps that I had to uh, a record store uh, about an hour drive away from my house. Um, and uh, these are an old uh, Canadian company. I think they've since been bought out by uh, Klipsch. But uh, they were a Canadian company uh, an, an initially, um, and they really put Canada on the loudspeaker map. So uh, check them out if you're interested. Uh, uh, one of their claims to fame is that the uh, the driver or the woofer there on the bottom um, is actually filled with what's called ferrofluid, and the ferrofluid um, acts as like a magnetic conductor that uh, is supposed to actually make a huge difference I guess in the sound and the, the bass quality um, I don't really know much about it um, I just know that they're highly sought after although when they fail they're supposed to fail spectacularly um, and there's only one person in the world which happens to actually be located in Nova Scotia where I live um, that fixes them that re actually can replace the drivers with new drivers that have this fluid in them um ferro fluid it's called so yeah that hasn't happened to me yet hopefully it never will um if it does i guess i'll i'll deal with that when i come to it i've had them for probably two three years now and they've always sound had amazing sound and i absolutely love them they're quite heavy they're like i don't know 50 60 pounds each i think so um, 30 kilograms, something like that. So, um, yeah, I highly recommend these if you can find them. I think they're pretty difficult to find. Um, and they're not overly expensive. You could probably get a pair of them for like five or 600 bucks, but, um, but they are getting harder to find. Um, I've had lots of speakers over the years, but these ones are by far the coolest and probably best sounding I've owned. So, um, and I totally got them from a fluke but my last pair had some issues it actually turned out to be an amp and probably not the speakers in the long run um but still i highly recommend these speakers and uh they're great just gives you uh, a small uh, indication of what these speakers are like and that was <clears throat> that was like three notches um, so yeah I can't really go any louder than that because it's just gonna you know annoy the neighbors and the family and, and whatnot although I did put soundproofing in uh, the ceiling and the walls when I rent when I renovated this room um, so hopefully that helped a little bit um, So <clears throat> I think that's pretty much going to do it for me. Um, hopefully I've tried to explain a little, bit of, a little bit about why I consider myself an audiophile, what that means to me, and uh, yeah, how important my music is to me uh, and my system that I play it on. And uh, yeah, I uh, look forward to your opinions and your comments. Thanks, guys.